during the position of the lockdown, I had a brush with the law. And there was a police DSP who thought that, well, we should have come to ask him for permission before uh, trying to test the drone. In fact, we were going to him to go and ask for him. So they were running towards us and we were, run, we were, we were walking towards them. And they took us to the police station. We spent close to three hours. Hello. I guess you're wondering what this is all about. Well, this is our new show on Abna Kwabna TV, Behind the Front Line, where you get to hear all the untold stories of storytellers, journalists who are going through a lot just to bring you news and updates on the COVID-19 pandemic. Every episode will feature a journalist who would share his or her story on how life has been being a journalist in this era. Today, we focus on Johnny Hughes, a renowned journalist with a TV3 network in Ghana who tells us what life has been like for him as a journalist in the face of COVID-19. Let's meet Johnny, get up close and personal with him. Hello, Johnny. Hi, Catherine. How has it been? Well, we've been greater than Accra. Life has been good so far. Um, we're, we're going about our duties, only being worried about the escalation of the figures, um, the horizontal infections that are coming up due to the pandemic. And we only pray that things will get better. Uh, but you have been working all through right. the Yes, right. so can you share with us how COVID-19 has affected your job as a journalist, I mean, positively, negatively? Well, it, it's, uh, thank you very much, Catherine. It's, it's affected our work a great deal. Um, you've worked in this terrain before, so you understand how the, the day goes. Usually you come in, in, your, in our numbers, we go for the early morning meeting or briefing. We look at what uh, the day would look like to set the agenda and then we step out, whether it's for sit-down assignments for various or for paid-for assignments, we go out there and we bring back the stories, we edit them and push them out. But with the lockdown or imposition of restrictions, you would find that not many of those activities were happening. Sometimes it became also very difficult, I mean, to observe social distancing. You and I know that you have to connect with a guest sometimes with a firm handshake or sometimes a hug or sometimes a guest that you know very well. Uh, you know, you chit chat with a guest uh, at close proximity before you go on set to do that interview. But all of that has is, is gone away with Corona. And so your, your icebreakers were quite limited if you had to do an interview. I mean, you are interviewing somebody on Zoom for the very first time. You have not met the person. The person has not met you before. And you're going straight to, to the conversation. And it's as if you would have to either make it work or not make it work. But the positive side of the conversation is that, well, now... If you, for example, were providing breakfast or refreshment for your guests coming in studio, you're providing honorarium or transportation for your guests coming in studio, all of that is not happening anymore mm. because you are now just latching on their data and their availability. People can ha have the comfort of staying in their homes to, to broadcast and to, to share knowledge and information with you. And sometimes the advantage here is that even though they may have prepared adequately for the interview, there are sometimes that they quickly can dash to, um, you know, their closet or their, their study, their cupboard or uh, wherever it is to bring out ex extra material while we are ready to come and add on to. I mean, that advantage would not ordinarily come to us if they were, they were just stuck in the studio with you. So it's come with these negative and positives. And what I think is that it's going to impact the world of work heavily. People may lose their jobs. Um, the modus operandi may change. I'm speaking to you now via Zoom. I don't have a cameraman here. I don't have a light man here. I don't have a sound man here. I'm alone with my phone and a holder, and we're doing this broadcast. It, it may as well go on air and, and, and flow through. What it means is that four or five people could lose their jobs if this you know, modus operandi is um, kept. And what it means also is that people, a lot more people, 
will now start agitating and saying, well, can we take a second look at it? So the conversation is that it's affected journalism heavily, positive and negatives, but I think the negatives outweigh the positives. Only a, a, a little silver lining uh, in the thick clouds lines there for, for the practice of journalism going to the future. Very well said, Johnny. It's actually affected everything. And these job cuts that you're saying is already happening. But let's mm. look at your personal experience in this period. Right. Uh, having to come to work during this lockdown, uh, having to come out while your family is home, the mm. risk of, I mean, contracting the disease and taking it home and all that. Mm. What can you share with us in that regard? Well, so thank you. Quite, quite an interesting perspective, um, if you will. My wife is very, very cautious about it because I have a little son who just turned one uh, three or four days ago. So we decided that we're going to put in a very strict um, measure, which includes that new day, for example, the uh, show I host on TV3, the morning show on TV3 in Ghana, had, um, is a quintessential example. You'd usually find me wearing a suit and a tie and looking all dashing and, uh, and dapper. I don't do that anymore. Now I, I resorted to uh, easy wears and African prints that I can quickly take off and put out there into the wash quickly as soon as I return from work. I mean, I can't do that with my suits because you would have to take your suits to the laundry and wait for three, four days and it comes back. And you can't also uh, drop your suits every day in the wash. I mean, that's unthinkable. So that's the first step we took and I decided and agreed with management on, on that particular one. So now if you watch New Day, you will not find me wear suits. I, I would wear the regular African print so that my family is protected. I get home. I think uh, it's, I take it's, everything. it's even better, Johnny. Yes. To, to yes. And I think... <laughs> 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 And I and I take I take off everything um, <laughs> right at the entrance, and then we put it in uh, Dettol or some some form of disinfectant. And before I step in, as soon as I step in, I go right into the shower. I go and uh, take my bath, and then I come back to reunite my family. I remember also particularly that during the position of the lockdown, I had a brush with the law. The police uh, had gone out with uh, Daniel Clue with a drone, and usually you would want to calibrate your drone so that in the event that it loses track or your battery is runs out, the drone comes back to the earlier position where it was calibrated from. And there was a police DSP who thought that, well, we should have come to ask him for permission before uh, trying to test the drone. In fact, we were going to him to go and ask for him. So they were running towards us and we were, running, we were, we were walking towards them. And they took us to the police station. We spent close to three hours so when the divisional commander came on, ACP, uh, ACP Fra uh, Francis Chidi came and we explained to him, he says, well, um, thankfully he had had uh, an opportunity to know what a drone is, how it is used and all of that. And he says, well, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just recalibrating it because we showed him, uh, you know, the receptacle or the story system where the images would have been stored, the visuals would have been stored. He says, there's nothing that we shot. So because he sees the drone actually. So after three hours was fine and we recorded him and then, the rest is history, as we say. But, but Johnny, also, wasn't that um, you were not branded in any way? Because if we're working, I, I, I just think that you, you, you'll be carrying microphones or working mm -hmm. with the office car or your staff ID, which could tell them who you were, even if they didn't know you on TV. So why right. was that the case that they were just trying to make your work difficult? Surprisingly, they, they knew me. They, they could recognize my face. Um, it was a joint police and military team. They could recognize my face. Surprisingly, um, we were in TV3 branded um, uh, apparel. Surprisingly, we were in uh, uh, COVID-19 tags. Surprisingly, we were in a, a TV3 vehicle and the vehicle was closed by. We had a branded microphone. The camera was branded as well. So it was quite surprising and shocking that all of that happened. And again, it goes back to the point that at that, at that instance, the, some vehicles were not being allowed to move on because they didn't have the requisite permit to move around. And that was what they were preventing. It was a bit chaotic. So the assumption was that we were trying to film what was chaotic, which was newsworthy at, at, as well, um, to put out there. And so they came at us. It was actually a staff sergeant, a chief inspector, and four other people who came at us. And they took us to a DSP. Uh, who was the man in charge at the time. In fact, he detained us there at, in the sun 
we were standing in the sand. And nobody was talking to us. Over, over a very long period of time, about one hour, there was a superintendent that came. He said he was doing monitoring and evaluation. He came, he spoke to us, and he left. There was a, a, a lieutenant of, a, of the army who also came. He spoke with us, and he left. And so we're standing there until the DSP says, well, because we went back to ask him, why is he keeping us there? And he says, okay, take us to the station. My first uh, thinking was that, well, we're going to be incarcerated or we're going to put behind bars. So I was ready for it. I just made a call to the office and told them, well, this is what is happening. So if you don't hear from us in the next hour or two, you may want to check up on us. And but when we went there, the inspector, the chief inspector, asked that we go and wait at the office of the divisional commander, who was also not in. So and after another hour, he came in, and the rest is, is history. We're, we're very good friends now. I think there was some bit of frustration and misunderstanding at the, at the beginning. Wow, that's a very interesting, I mean, incident there. And this, this, this happened to uh, a lot more people during the lockdown. And that's why we have decided to throw more light on these issues. But let's look at your personal relationship with colleagues in the newsroom. Because I know the newsroom and how things work. Eating mm. together, joking together. Right. Right. Editing right. at the editing bench, you have the editor and the BJ sitting in close mm. proximity mm. and all that. Right. How has mm. COVID nineteen affected all these relationships in the newsroom? Well, it's, it's changed you it's, it's personally, changed. Johnny. It's it's changed heavily, Catherine. Things have changed. Things are not the same anymore. Like what I would think um, and say, what 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 happens now is that we have groups and batches working in teams. Um, so people work from uh, first group, for example, works for three days, goes up for another three days, another team comes in for three days. So we alternate. I mean, you always have three days in, three days out. That's how it works. So that we're able to have a lot more space to observe social distancing in the newsroom. Mm. Add so on to that. Miss, well, what do you miss in the newsroom? I mean, well, well, that's, I mean, you know, that's you know, the you chats, because of COVID, the chit chats, uh, we miss them. We miss the jokes. Like you mentioned, we miss uh, eating together. We miss the early morning hugs with our colleagues and friends, happy to be united to see and ourselves. I mean, discussing story ideas. Usually would would I mean would discuss story ideas of a cup of coffee or or a meal and, and chat. I mean, we've had so many of those conversations, uh, how to shape the story. Sometimes you're going out and these days you can't even go out, um, you know, not more than three people in a vehicle. And that's that's something really. I mean, previously we could pack uh, five people in a vehicle and then drop off one team at an assignment and then go on to drop the other team at an assignment. Now you can't do that. Now you can't cramp everybody in and wait and say after news at 10 or news at 7, we're dropping people uh, from house to house. Now, after somebody's done with their work, you quickly go drop them and come back in again. A lot has changed. Um, if you go to the editing bench, for example, you don't have people queuing up there because everything is now scheduled. And also because you don't have the full complement of the newsroom turning up on a daily basis. The editing suite is usually, we have about five or six editing suites now. And it's usually relaxed. A lot more people are now resorting to using their own laptops um, to, to do their own editing. It, it's, it's quite uh, changed our lives um, a great deal. And you will, you will think that will this continue, should this continue? Would people's job be safe? That's the question people ask if they, they ask, even though silently. But, but that's the conundrum that is, is left to be answered. So, um, how do you, on a normal day, I mean, in the face of COVID-19, on a normal day when Johnny Hughes wakes up, how do you prepare going to work? I mean, with a, with a fear of, I mean, maybe getting into contact with people who have the disease or having to do stories in areas where you are at risk of contracting mm. the disease? Well, you, you wake up in the morning, the first thing you're doing is you, you pray and you ask God to, to protect you. Step out. Um, I usually would have my Robin alcohol in my side bag. That means that uh, if the driver comes to pick me up or I'm driving myself, um, you would have to disinfect the, the handles, or the door handles. Um, you would have to disinfect the steer. So you would wear your mask while you're sitting by the driver. It's quite unfriendly. It looks awkward if you ask me. 
you get to work and you can't hug, you can shake hands, you get into the sound room, everybody is keeping a certain distance, you, you greet people, they mic you, or sometimes they disinfect the microphone and they give it to you to mic yourself, which is now their norm of the day, actually. They disinfect the microphones and they give it to you to mic yourself because you, you can't be too sure what's on their hands or on their clothes while they put it through yours. Um, you get on set and you're maintaining that distance even on air. Your guests come in, you're wearing a face mask, and you insist that if you don't have a face mask, they are not entering the premises or they are not sitting on your set. Um, now, we, especially for the males, we have options of uh, they putting on their own powder or, or wearing their own powder or smearing their own powder on their faces, I beg your pardon. And for the females, uh, each time the brushes are used, they are sterilized in, in, under UV light. Now, you would ask yourself, usually you'd want to go and see your guest off after you're done with paper review, for example. I would do that, and I do that very, very often. These days, it's tough. You can't do that. You can't eat outside anymore. Your regular eateries, you can't eat outside because not a lot of them are open down. Most of them are mm. running at 5 to 10% capacity. And so everything, Catherine, has changed. Every single thing. I mean, the MPs who come shake hands with you and, they can't shake out the policymakers, newsmakers, they shake hands with you. Even the newspapers now, these days, uh, once the papers come in, we either will put them, uh, we'll, we either will spray them a bit with, um, uh, you know, rubbing alcohol spray, or we would have to put them through UV lights, or we would have to just take photos from a distance and put them on the screen and review the papers from on the three by three. Wow. It, it's, so, it's, Johnny, it's, have, have you done a story that brought you close to? The situation, as in having done stories on persons who have contracted the disease or going close to an area which uh, have been identified as uh, a COVID-19 zone. Mm. My, my closest was um, when the two suspected cases happened at um, Kolibu and the doctors allegedly fled the emergency ward because they were they didn't have the PPEs and they were scared for their lives. That was my closest. And I, I was asking the question, that story, as to why Ridge Hospital or the Cryo Regional Hospital had been named as the holding center for such COVID-19 cases. And yet the patients were kept at the Kolebu Regional Hospital for two straight days. I mean, with people who were more susceptible to a lot of infections and ailments in the uh, emergency ward. So these are some of the stories that I've been able to do from where I sit. Well, Thank you very much, Johnny. I mean, uh, you guys are doing a great job. And that's why we chose to celebrate journalists on this show, give you the opportunity to share the stories that you can't ordinarily share on TV, stories mm. you can't share on radio, but you still right. have got to tell it anyways. And so mm. thank you so much for your time. Kudos to you and your colleagues. And mm. uh, we pray that you stay safe. Right. We'll be talking to you. And, 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 and I, before I go, Catherine, thank you very much also for having me. There's one conundrum that I've been trying to, um, you know, answer. For example, for the first time in world history, it's become okay or the norm to have persons wear face masks, which actually um, hides their identity, and also to wear gloves and, if you like, spectacles into a banking hall to transact business. In Ghana, I've still not heard how security is being beefed in that direction because you could have unscrupulous people get in there and do that kind of thing. It's one of the stories that I've also pushed forward in, in that agenda. But the bottom line is that the enemy is the virus. And if you don't have anything to do out there, stay at home, stay safe, wash your hands, eat healthy, take your vitamin C, boost your immune system, and exercise regularly, keep your social distance, and keep your hope alive. All of this will, will go away very soon. If we but Johnny, Johnny have, have you been exercising yourself? I have been exercising both internally and externally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Johnny. Cheers. Cheers. Happy talking to Johnny Hughes, my colleague and friend at TV3 Media General Network Limited in Ghana. Johnny, it's been great talking to you. Keep doing the good work that you're doing and please keep on exercising inward and outward and stay safe. <laughs>